Hello class, welcome back. This is Matt Crump and we are going to do the lecture um, for our learning module on mental imagery for Psych 2530. We're going to cover early research from the 1880s all the way to very current research in the 2020s and some of the stuff that happened in between. So let's get started. First of all, as a reminder, the readings for this module are from chapter two in the textbook. So make sure you read that. This a set of slides will mainly go over uh, what we talked about in the textbook readings. Here's a little roadmap. First thing we'll talk about is generally defined mental imagery and the process of introspection that has sometimes been used to investigate mental imagery. Then we'll talk about aphantasia and hyperphantasia, which are two sides of the mental imagery coin. We will look at how mental imagery might or might not aid memory abilities. And we're, we're gonna end with a debate about mental imagery processes that took place throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So what is mental imagery? I'll give you a little definition here. It's the subjective experience of internal perception-like sensations. So some examples could include visual imagery or seeing pictures in your mind's eye. For example, if you close your eyes and imagine something, that thing you're imagining, what does it look like? Does it look like something um, that you would see if you had your eyes open? Does it have the same kind of vividness or not? We could also have auditory imagery or hearing sounds or music in your head when you're uh, not having that stuff play outside. So if you walk around and you have a song stuck in your head, that could be an example of experiencing auditory imagery. You could also have taste or smell imagery or other forms of mental imagery. If we go to around the 1880s, we're gonna see some very early examples of researchers starting to ask questions about mental imagery processes. This is Sir Francis Galton, and he's one of the first people to start investigating differences between people in their mental imagery abilities. I posted a link. Uh, if you click this link, it'll take you to archive.org. And if you wanna read the original manuscript, you can go and do that. It's in the public domain. It's pretty interesting. And just for fun, I clicked the link Here's what it looks like. It's only 22 pages long. You could flip through it and uh, read it directly to see what was going on in the research. I'm gonna summarize it for us. So let's head back to the slides and we'll talk about what Galton did. So the title of his work was Statistics of Mental Imagery. So what did he do? Here's, oops, here's what he did. Galton asked 100 distinguished men of science uh, or maybe just distinguished men from his time period to describe the vividness of their mental imagery. And he came up with what I'll call the breakfast table task. And what does this involve? Here's the breakfast table task. And this is taken from the manuscript. So Galton sent letters around to these people. And in the letter, it said, it asked them to do this. It said, Think of some definite object, suppose it's your breakfast table as you sat down to it this morning, and carefully the picture that rises before your mind's eye. All right, so if I was to do that, I didn't sit at a breakfast table this morning, um, but I can sort of see the counter, and you know, I made an, I blended an apple today, so I, I could kind of see that apple there. I think that's that that's what Galton is asking other people to do to think about something like the breakfast you ate earlier today imagine it in your mind's eye and then he had people uh, write back to him in the letter and describe the properties of the visual or the mental image they were experiencing he wanted to know stuff like this so what was the illumination like was the image in your mind dim or clear was the brightness comparable to the actual scene? What about the overall definition? Were the objects well-defined? Um, 
were they fuzzy? Was it, did it look like the way the things are laid out in the normal scene or was some parts of it squished or contracted? What about the colors? Uh, so he's got some funny examples from the 1880s. Are the colors of the china, of the toast and the bread crust, mustard, meat and parsley? Or what would, I guess uh, mustard, meat and parsley are common breakfast items in the 1880s or whatever may be on the table. Were the coloring distinct? So he wants people to answer about all of these questions, to, which is a way of using words to describe the quality or the vividness of their mental imagery. So one thing to consider here uh, for yourself is what would you say if, if you took five minutes or two minutes to sit, to close your eyes, let's say, and imagine what you had for breakfast, how would you rate the vividness of your mental imagery? So you could pause this and try it out and think about it yourself. And if you have unpaused and come back to the video, here are some numbers you could use to describe the vividness. So some people might choose a one. They would say, well, when I imagine these things, I'm getting like super extremely vivid mental imagery. It's like, it's like I'm eating breakfast all over again in real life. I can't tell the difference between my imagination of eating breakfast and when I actually ate breakfast earlier on in real life. A two might be something like, well, it's vivid. You can picture it pretty well. How about a three? Three might be, it's fuzzy, you know, it's not really lifelike so much, but you could remember it. A four might be no imagery, not at all lifelike, no mental pictures. So when you're thinking about your breakfast, you know what you had for breakfast, but there's no imagery experience of reliving uh, this experience. So I, I listed these options from very, very vivid to no vividness or no mental imagery at all. So now that you have uh, maybe considered what kind of number you would give for yourself, let's go and see what uh, those hundred people wrote back to Galton. So what did Galton's participants say? What did Galton find? Remember, uh, Galton was asking these people to describe the vividness of their mental imagery. So the main thing that Galton uh, found in the 1880s was a wide range of individual differences. The people reported almost everything from extremely vivid to nothing at all. Here are some examples. And uh, these examples here are what people wrote back to him. So they're direct quotes from what people wrote back. So one person wrote back and said, brilliant, distinct, never blotchy. Another person said, quite comparable to the real object, I feel as though I was dazzled. For example, when recalling the sun to my mental vision. So this person is like, ah, it's so bright. And the last person says, in some instances, quite as bright as an actual scene. So these kind of people would have extremely vivid mental imagery. There was people who uh, gave sort of like in the middle type of descriptions. Here's one. Uh, fairly clear, not quite comparable to that of the actual scene. Some objects are more sharply defined than others. The more familiar objects coming more distinctly in my mind. And finally, we have some people who were not vivid at all. So here's one person who said, my powers are zero to my consciousness. There is almost no association of memory with objective visual impressions. I recollect the breakfast table, but do not see it. All right. So, um, one of the things that was used here, this is sort of a common method in psychology. It's used in the early research in the 1880s. It's used in various ways today. It is the method uh, that I use and I asked you to use to gather evidence about your own mental imagery vividness. And this is called introspection, the process of inspecting or thinking about your own cognition. And this is what Galton asked his participants to do in order to 
gain information about people's mental imagery abilities. The reason I'm bringing up uh, introspection here is because in the context of our course, we're going to be both evaluating cognitive abilities, things like mental imagery that are pretty interesting, we're trying to figure out how they work, and we'll be talking about the methods that are used to gain knowledge about how those abilities work. And there's different kinds of methods, and methods have limitations and pros and cons, and introspection is one of these methods that has some pros and has some cons. Um, Galton in the 1880s, you know, he got a bunch of people interested in mental imagery. And so if we move forward in time to the early 1900s in the US, we can see some American psychologists using the same methods, so methods of introspection, to try to figure out uh, things about human cognition, including mental imagery. So I've got some pictures of E.B. Titchener and Margaret Floyd Washburn. And these two uh, used introspection. They had a school of psychology called structuralism. And uh, they were following up in many ways on what Galton was doing. To give an example, uh, sorry, scratch that. The, the next uh, thing I want to talk about is uh, research using Titchener's approach in America that was an attempt to replicate Galton's findings. So one of the findings that we are focusing on right now is the idea that mental imagery is a thing, it's an ability, but people have great variation in that ability. Some people experience extremely vivid mental imagery, and some people experience almost none, and many people experience everything in between. So that's the general pattern. That's what Galton found in the 100 people he asked about it. We can wonder, is this something that anyone would find? Is this something that is true about mental imagery? And in the early 1900s, there was efforts to try the same methods on different sets of people to see what happens, to see if Galton's basic findings are replicated. So let's take a look at uh, one replication attempt. Um, and I, I'll say that in general, they did find uh, similar results as what Galton found. And, and here's one from French in 1902. So this is a, a mental imagery of students, a summary of the replies given to Titchener's questionnaire by 118 juniors in Vassar College. And that's the name of the, the, the paper where this research was reported. You could go read it. It's in the journal Psychological Review published in 1902. Now in, in this work, they didn't use the breakfast table task specifically. They came up with a different set of questions. These were Titchener's questions. And I've printed some of them here. You can read them just to see what was going on back in 1902. So here's the first question. Think of a bunch of white rosebuds lying among fern leaves in a florist's box. And OK, so you're supposed to imagine that. And then they're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. So are the colors, the creamy white, the green, the shining white, quite distinct and natural? And then people will answer yes or no. And you could see the numbers here about what people said. So 118 people said yes. Do you see the flowers in a good light? So most people said yes, but a few people said no. Is the image as bright as the objects would be if they lay on the table before you? And we got about half and half here. And there's all sorts of things. Um, can you call up the scent of the rosebuds, of the damp pasteboard? Can you feel the softness of the rose petals? Now, this is just uh, one set of questions. And the questionnaire actually goes on and on and on and on. And you could see by inspecting how many people say yes to the question, how, pe how many people say no, you could kind of get an idea of um, the, the range of behavior here. So some people are the kind of people they're going to say yes all the time because they have, they are saying they have uh, extremely vivid mental imagery. And other people 
will say yes and no kind of in the middle. And, and there will be people who perhaps say no most of the time also. So in considering these kinds of questions, you know, like what's going on when somebody imagines something and how vivid is that person's imagination? And the idea that some people are claiming their imagination is so super vivid, it's almost like real life or indistinguishable from real life. And then you have on the other hand, people saying, I don't have imagination like that. It doesn't really look like anything at all. Those are very different kinds of experiences. And you might be wondering, well, is it true? Are those, is it true that there's these two different kinds of people? Or is there, is it, could it, could it be that these different kinds of people are using different words to describe fundamentally the same mental experience? Can we really trust what people are telling us? All of these concerns flow from the method used to ask questions about mental imagery. And so there's clearly some limitations to introspectionism. Let me pose a question. If you were trying to investigate cognitive abilities, like how good somebody's, or how vivid, let me say, is somebody's uh, mental imagery, what would be some limitations of the introspection approach? Now let me just uh, list, list a few common complaints. Here's one. The measure is subjective. I get to say what I'm experiencing subjectively, but no one else can objectively uh, confirm that what I'm saying is actually what's going on. We have uh, an issue there. The primary issue is that the measure is not independently observable. So other people can't uh, verify my claims. They can't subject my claims to scrutiny. It's possible that when people use introspection, um, they might decide to lie about their experience because we can't independently verify the claims. We always could be wondering if people might be lying. Another issue is that let's say people weren't lying. Maybe they're not very good at describing their own mental processes. So the words that are used to describe the mental experience might not be up to the task of actually describing what that experience is like. I referenced this limitation earlier. It's possible that people might use different sets of descriptions to actually refer to the same kind of experience. And that would mean that Although people are saying they're experiencing wildly different kinds of mental imagery, they really aren't. Uh, but who is to know? Because we can't objectively verify these things with the method of introspection. And of course, it's a bit of a catch-22 with uh, the topic of mental imagery. Um, that topic is all about what it's like to be you how you subjectively experience your own cognition. And, uh, you know, I, from my point of view, um, at least one person who knows what that's like is you. So uh, you would be a good person to ask to figure out what's going on in your own cognition, at least as, uh, as a venue, as a way to gain knowledge about how mental imagery works. So although introspection has numerous issues, it also is a valuable technique. Because of these issues with introspectionism, as a method in psychology, it uh, had some popularity in the early 1900s, and it declined in popularity because uh, for several reasons. For one, it was criticized by the behaviorists, and We'll discuss this school of psychology that came to prominence in the 20s, 30s, and 40s in chapter 6. Um, so this is a little bit of a, for those of you that are familiar with the history of psychology, this is a, a tracing out some of the contours of that. And we will continue to do that in the textbook. All right, let's move on to the next topic, aphantasia and hyperphantasia. These are two interesting kinds of terms. 
And what we're going to do now, speaking of sort of history of psychology, is we're going to do a little time travel. We're going to jump forward, skip almost a hundred years of research, and talk about mental imagery research in the 2010s. Because this is where the words aphantasia and hyperphantasia first start popping up. So as we will see later in the lecture when we start filling in the gaps, in the historical gaps, uh, interest in mental imagery research has kind of gone up and down over the years. And in 2010, uh, this British psychologist, Adam Zeman, published a paper that got a lot of interest. The title is Loss of Imagery Phenomenology with Intact Visual Spatial Task Performance, a Case of Blind Imagination. So this is a case study where one of the, uh, where the person uh, under investigation claims to have essentially zero visual imagery. So we've come across this idea in our previous discussions. Galton in the 1880s had a few people write back that said, you know, I don't have mental imagery. And in 2010, uh, Zeman is sort of talking about another person uh, that he came across in his research who is claiming they have uh, zero visual imagery abilities. And for various reasons, people find this very interesting. Um, what I want to do is focus on some of the similarities in the uh, methodological approach in the 2010s uh, and back to the Galton era. So what's going on in 2010 isn't a whole lot different from what we've already seen. Um, in 1973, a British psychologist, uh, Marx, he created a, an updated questionnaire to measure the vividness of mental imagery. Uh, we talked about Galton's breakfast table method. We talked about Titchener's questions, all, of, all those questions about the flowers. Well, in 1973, Marx came up with something slightly shorter uh, than Titchener's very long questionnaire, and it was focusing directly on the vividness of visual imagery. So here's part of, this is the rating scale for Marx's questionnaire. And people would um, imagine things and then give a rating one to five. If they could imagine the things that perfectly clear and as vivid as normal vision, they give it a one, they give it a two, three, or four for things in between. And a five is no image at all. You only know that you are thinking of the object. Here's some examples of the kinds of questions that were asked to people. Um, for example, you might be asked to visualize a rising sun and then consider carefully the picture that comes before your mind's eyes. So you got your eyes closed, you're imagining a rising sun and your question is, okay, picture the sun is rising above the horizon into a hazy sky. I'm trying to do it. Something, I don't know. And what you're supposed to do there is think about one, two, three, four, five. So for me, I, I, on that one, you know, maybe I was distracted. I, I was kind of a three or a four, I, maybe somewhere between moderately clear and vague and dim, but it wasn't perfectly clear and as vivid as normal vision. So people would go and answer all these questions. And at the end of the day, you get uh, an average. So the average that you would give across all those questions. And just as a pausing point here, there's another video associated with this mini, uh, sorry, with this learning module. And in that, uh, video, we go and read the Marx 1973 paper and learn why he came up with this questionnaire and how he used it to investigate memory abilities. But because he made this questionnaire, other people were using it. So Zeman got this questionnaire and he had his uh, participants fill out this questionnaire uh, because he got interested in, well, you know, how many people out there uh, are experiencing these 
wild extremes in uh, mental imagery ability. So again, in 2015, after Zeman had found one person who was saying they have essentially nil visual imagery, they got uh, a bunch more people to fill out the VVIQ. That's this uh, vividness of visual imagery questionnaire. And they found, um, you know, a bunch of people again who are getting very low scores. They're saying that they essentially don't have visual imagery. And to describe this group of people, Zeman coined the phrase aphantasia. And this refers to the condition of experiencing limited or no mental imagery. Similarly, the term hyperphantasia refers to the very opposite extreme, where people report extremely vivid and lifelike mental imagery. This work uh, often comes along with some media interest, so you might have come across this. Uh, there was a recent article that is 2021 in the New York Times. I've got the link here. And it's, uh, you know, just these are interesting things. I think from a human perspective, you might be someone who has extremely vivid mental imagery. And if you've never considered what it's like for other people, it might be a little bit um, curious to learn that some people don't have vivid mental imagery at all. At the same time, you might not have vivid mental imagery. You may, maybe you have aphantasia and you don't experience mental imagery. And if you have not thought about what it's like for other people's experience, you might be surprised to learn that some people experience extremely vivid mental imagery. And so you could read these uh, media articles about people kind of going through, oh, this is fascinating. People have these different kinds of mental imagery experiences. Some of the claims are quite extraordinary. So uh, here's a, a quote from the New York Times article, a quote from Joel Pearson, a cognitive neuroscientist at the University of New South Wales. And he's also been studying mental imagery since 2005. And it suggests that hyperphantasia could go far beyond just having an active imagination. It could be like having a very vivid dream and not being sure if it was real or not. And he suggests that people can watch a movie and then they can watch it again in their mind and it's indistinguishable. That's a pretty extraordinary ability, hyperphantasia. If you're interested in learning more about aphantasia and hyperphantasia and um, kind of what other people think about this, go check out aphantasia.com. This is a website and online community for people interested in mental imagery abilities. Here's the website. It was, I think, created by one of the participants in this research on mental imagery ability, the recent research. And it's, uh, it's you know, it's a bunch of discussion boards here and stuff like that. And you can check it out. So they're advertising 3% uh, of people have blind imagination. Do you? Take the quiz and find out. And, and my understanding is that if you took the quiz, it would be this uh, VVIQ uh, test from Marx 1973. All right, we're going to focus just a little bit on methods here. So if someone told you that they can replay a movie in their mind, and it's totally indistinguishable from actually watching the movie, that's a pretty extraordinary claim. And uh, you might not trust the person to believe what they're saying necessarily because it's kind of wild. And you might be wondering if there are methods besides introspection that we could use, for example, to verify or validate these kinds of claims. I'll briefly mention uh, that there are. We're not going to dive into this too much because this is still an introductory survey course, but uh, we could use brain imaging techniques to provide converging evidence about mental imagery. And as an example, you could uh, take people, put them in a functional magnetic resonance imaging device, and that's going to measure blood flow, oxygen, oxy the bold response, so that's the 
that's the blood oxygen levels in your brain, in various parts of your brain, and how they're changing over time as you perform a task. So you could do things like get people to engage in mental imagery or not engage in mental imagery while they're being scanned and try to figure out if there's, for example, different patterns of activity in visual areas, depending on whether people are engaging in a visual imagery task. And there's ongoing work on these kinds of things. I'll also bring up for fun, and this is back in 2013, so there's probably been some advances here. People are using what are called decoding techniques to try to figure out what your mental imagery or even dreams might look like. So if we could analyze the pattern of your brain activity while you're engaging in a dream or in mental imagery, can we, you know, basically put that on a computer monitor and take a look to see what the dream looks like? And th these techniques aren't that fully developed at this point, but they're, um, they're working on the problem and there has been some progress. Uh, okay, so I'm going to try to make these lectures short. That is 25 minutes plus and not an hour long. I'm looking at uh, this one. We're only halfway through and we're at 30 minutes already. So I'm going to stop here and I will make a second one to finish off this one. So this will be part one of two and uh, see you on the other side.